you have been introduced to Chappal and to Lene, so I'm not going to reintroduce you to them. But let me um, introduce Charlotte. And Charlotte, I hope I say your name right. right. Charlotte McLean Lapo is a is trained as a human rights lawyer. She's appointed by the President of the United States of America to her current role as coordinator of the Office for Disability and Inclusive Development in USAID. Ms. McLean Lapo was formerly World Bank Senior Operations Officer in the Human Development Network, working on East Asia and Pacific region and the Africa region. In 1999, she was appointed by President Mandela to the South Africa Human Rights Commission and reappointed by President Mbeki in 2002. She served as an expert on a number of UN committees in the areas of child rights, the right to food, and the rights of people with disabilities. She also represented the national human rights institutions at the UN during the process of developing the UN Convention for People with Disabilities. And uh, this um, panel is going to be moderated by Deepthi Samant. And Deepthi, I don't know how to, uh, I guess I'll have to introduce you from memory because I don't see anything there. I don't, I, I don't know all of Deepthi's credentials, but um, I can tell you that we've worked with her now for many, many years. She's currently at Britain Blatt. Um, she and Becky were really the, um, the architects or the troublemakers who got a lot of this started um, and working together thinking about how we could become more engaged in international work around assistive technology uh, and disability and, and rehabilitation. They um, uh, sort of dragged me, um, I, I, they didn't drag me, they wrote a paper and then and, and put my name on the end of it which was great. Um, so it was, uh, but really their work. Um, so dp has been um, doing some amazing work in this area already. And so this, this panel is really intended to be a wrap-up um, and to begin to uh, attempt to pull together the various strands of uh, information that we've discussed today. And I'll let DP take it from here. Well, um, I am the director of international programs for the Gordon Blatt Institute at Syracuse University and find myself extremely privileged to be hosting this panel of very, very um, accomplished experts. And, um, you know, we find ourselves this afternoon at the end of two incredibly information-rich days. You know, we've, we've learned so much and we've had people share their programs, their work, what they are doing to really make rehabilitation and assistive technology available in the most resource limited environments today. And yet at, you know, every stage we find ourselves asking why couldn't we do more and why were we still talking about small programs and how do we really you know, take this way beyond small segregated special programs and really brings us to our topic looking forward and making assistive technology and rehabilitation a priority and what do we mean by that? But making it a priority in our everyday development, in the development not just of individuals but also of their communities, of their countries because I think we know within this room over here that this is not just about some individuals in a country, it's about the entire country's growth and development. And uh, so what we want to do is really understand and learn from our experts here as to what our vision should be and what our work should be to take this, to really scale it up and make it a part of socioeconomic development as a whole. Um, Mark's already introduced our panelists, so let me share a little bit about how we want to organize this, um, this panel and then uh, let's move on to the questions. Uh, but we have uh, about three to four questions that we want to throw at our panelists 
to you know really get the discussion started. And I'm going to invite one panelist to lead on every question and then invite the others to share their thoughts. Uh, we will keep um, time at the end for your questions. I would like to request you to hold your questions and we'll make sure we have adequate time for that. So let me start with the very first question and I'm going to start with something a lot of you have mentioned, our presenters have mentioned, which is the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and specifically Article 32 which talks about international cooperation. And um, you know, it, it, it's really, it, the Article 32 in itself is an innovation in a human rights treaty. And it's specifically meant to spur knowledge exchange, um, you know, countries helping other countries with capacity building and sharing scientific and technical knowledge and specifically talks about countries helping other countries build capacity around assistive and accessible technologies and you know enabling the transfer of technologies and I'm you know I would like to ask our panelists how we can use that how we can use that to really spur program development around assistive technology um, Charlotte I'd like to start with you and um, get your perspective on this and maybe also hear how USAID has been uh, doing some work around assistive technology thank you Uh, Charlotte, if you can hear us, um, if you could just press the, the talk icon, uh, which has a little microphone there. Oh, it's a big microphone. It's a okay, big can microphone. You hear me now? <laughs> there you are. Thank you. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes! Yay! <laughs> okay. So should I start again? Oh, I'm sorry, Charlotte. Yes. Let me repeat the question. Okay, so um, I, uh, I, was just, uh, I was just talking about Article 32 of the Convention and how it is an innovation in itself in trying to spur countries to work with other countries uh, to build capacity and to share scientific and technical knowledge. And Specifically, it actually mentions accessible and assistive technologies, um, and it talks about how countries should help each other in you know, transferring technologies and making accessible and assistive technologies available. And um, you know, I'd like to request you to start off this discussion, um, think, you know, talking about how we can use Article 32 to really make access to assistive technology possible, and if you could maybe share some of uh, USAID's work in this. So I wanted to first of all say thank you to uh, Mark and Gypsy. And Mark, I think you did a good job of pronouncing my last name, which is not an easy one to pronounce. Uh, so you're covered. Um, Gypsy, you you know you talked about the the um, Article 32, and I think there. There are a lot of things about that article that, that stand out um, and that can and should be used by anybody working in this area. I mean, I think the first thing is to recognize that um, Article 32 is one of the is one of the few articles, or the only article, um, that speaks to international cooperation in international human rights treaties. So this is this is quite a novelty, and I think that then allows people to interpret that article um, to the, the best of our advantage. The other thing that I think is really important to allude to that is that it talks about the importance of countries working um, together. Um, 
And I think for me, one of the very refreshing things about Article 32 is that it's not just about North-South dialogue. It's very much about South-South dialogue. Um, and embedded into all of that is the importance of including um, persons with disabilities in all of the discussions. And I think that we shouldn't lose sight of that. I think it's absolutely essential that when we speak about you know, the development of assistive technologies, um, we need to make sure that people with disabilities are not just seen as end users, but are um, involved in the design, decision making, and in all the steps um, towards, you know, towards the ultimate end. Um, so just a few comments in relation to, to that, to, to, to the article. I think what's also very important about the article is that this is the first time that we now have a legally binding obligation. Um, and so states that have ratified the convention are going to have to report on all of the articles, including Article 32, um, in terms of what they have been doing in relation to um, assistive technologies. Um, but in addition to that, it's going to require um, donors to talk about what they're doing in regards to international cooperation and how assistance is being delivered um, for the development of in uh, things like assistive technologies. So I think it's a very comprehensive um, article and I think it's an article that should be used by DPOs, by NGOs, by academia, as um, a tool or a base, for, a platform for engagement with, with donors. Uh, because I think it's, it, it really provides an excellent framework for what it is donors should be thinking about and what it is donors should be doing. Obviously, the expertise, the specific expertise um, around assistive devices then would come from experts that work in that area. And again, I just want to emphasize the importance of um, you know, the role of disabled people themselves and disabled people's organizations. Um, I think that it's very important, you, somebody had mentioned earlier on that, you know, we need to start looking at how do we take this issue to scale? How do we make, how do we make um, the development of assistive technologies part of the social and economic development that's happening in the countries in which we work and in which we live? Well, I think one of the things to do, um, or I would suggest that one of the things to, to explore is A, to work with universities. And I think that that's really an important place to start working. To start working with universities, um, exploring options, getting good research. And I know that this is happening and, and I think, you know, perhaps um, finding a way to share those experiences, some sort of repository where those experiences could be shared would be would be very beneficial for um, a whole range of other um, universities that are thinking about doing the same doing the same thing. I also think that in many in many developing countries you have um, para parastatal um, that have been set up um, you know by government to look at you know innovation. Um, science and technology type related issues. And I think again, it's really in our interest to challenge those types of institutions um, to get involved in the development of low cost assistive technology, but even mid middle cost and, and, and just high cost te technology. Get them involved. Um, very often they have excellent researchers, they have maybe not too, many, too much resources, but they have some resources. But I think that they are an excellent um, um, group to work with. And then I think working with um, various uh, think tanks is also important. Um, getting them to think about how do we make this part of our um, economic, and, uh, economic development discussion. Because I think if we don't do that, um, there's no way that we're going to we're going to scale up. It will continue to be, you know, small projects. Um, they are in a number of um, certainly in, on the African continent. We're seeing a number of 
um, training centers that have been um, set up to work in the area of assistive um, technology. But I think that we need to find ways to to support those um, and to to help those those centers really reach out um, and train and have have a lot more um, people on the continent um, and in the developing world um, charged with and responsible for the development of assistive technology. Um, some of you will know that USAID has um, a disability fund, and that disability fund has supported a number of programs in the developing world um, in, in the area of assistive technologies, um, either in the development of or in some instances providing resources for uh, research or publications that can guide and assist um, the development of assistive technology. So there are a number of different angles um, that the agency has engaged in. Um, you know, it's an important piece of our work. We see rehabilitation as definitely a cross-cutting issue, um, and it pertains to not just rehabilitation in, in, in its strict sense, um, but very much it should be seen as a pathway to employment, to involvement in the community, um, and a whole range of other a whole range of other issues. So I think um, from our end, we will continue to support um, this is the development of innovation around assistive technology. And um, to that effect, we will announce um, at the beginning of the fall um, a call for proposals for the Disability Fund, um, which is obviously open to everybody. To apply, and um, you know that's that's an excellent opportunity to look at the possibility of getting resources um, to look at innovation around assistive technologies. But in addition to the disability fund, I just wanted to flag um, another part of the agency um, that has been engaged. Um, and I, at this stage, I'm not at liberty to say which organization, um, but has been engaged in. Um, looking to support um, the development of assistive technologies um, in, 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 in various parts of the world. Um, and that, that part of that program is called IDEA. It's the innovation, it's an innovation trust, it's an innovation trust within USAID. And again, proposals are submitted, and there's obviously a panel in the process that goes through it. Um, and it you know, it's it's a great opportunity to access funds that are not just disability specific, but really are premised on the fact that there's an innovation behind it. So I think I'll stop there and um, perhaps contribute as we go along. Thank you so much, Charlie. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charlotte, for that um, you know wonderful explanation um, of what we can do with Article 32. And um, I wonder, if Nene or Chapal, if you wanted to add anything specific to the convention and Article 32. Thanks. Um, this is Lene. Um, hi, Charlotte. I wish you were here in person, um, but it's great to be doing this panel with you. Um, I guess the only other point that I would raise, and Charlotte's done just an amazing job of outlining all the possible ways that this is going to have a positive impact. But I think that as countries implement the CRPD and especially Article 32, I think we have an opportunity to be able to share best practices between countries, and I think that's going to help further the knowledge base. Um, and that's where I think we'll be able to take it from theory and research to actual practice. Um, so I, that would be the only other comment that I would add. Thank you so much, Lene. Um, I guess we can move on to the next question, uh, which, again, you know, really tied into funding. And um, something that has come across is that um, assistive technology continues to face not just assistive technology, but also rehabilitation. 
uh, continues to face these roadblocks in accessing funding from international aid and development agencies. And uh, we wanted to ask the panelists, you know, what they think are some of the continuing challenges in accessing that, those funds, but also maybe uh, what are some innovative solutions that you have seen that, you know, can help us go around those challenges and really start drawing from uh, mainstream international aid money to get this. Uh, Linnea, I wonder if you want to address this first. Um, thanks. I'd be glad to. Um, I've been doing policy work around um, disability for probably 30 years, and um, so often what we get forced into is a forced choice. And we end up in the funding cycles, and we are prioritized against one another. And so it's a matter of either or. And too often what that means is that we get pitted against one another um, when we're looking for critical funding. And I think when the international aid organizations start to look at the inclusion of people with disabilities, a focus on inclusive programs, um, when DPOs and um, organizations at a local level go to their international aid organizations or to their governments and they say, this is a program development that we're interested in. It will better the lives of people with disabilities. We can add to the um, economic impact, yada, yada, yada. Too often what we hear is, and I, I've heard this in the last two days, um, you know, the rate of unemployment for able-bodied people in our country is really high. Well, of course it is. I mean, we know that piece. When you then say that statement, you've already made an assumption that people with disabilities are worth less. And so I would really encourage us when we start to look at how do we help countries prioritize services and supports for people with disabilities, that we don't do it at the expense of another disability-related program, and we don't get forced into, well, if you want that, what will you give up? So I would just say that one of the ongoing challenges is always going to be compete, competing priorities. But we've got to figure out a different way to be able to strategize about why it's important that we prioritize rehabilitation in assistive technology. Um, a lot of times we characterize the involvement of people with disabilities in international organizations as kind of an add-on. That too often it is, oh, well, we include people with disabilities, and so we have a special program for them. Well, as soon as you start to try to build parallel programs, you've increased the cost. So if you're trying to present an argument in your country for the inclusion of strategies for people with disabilities, make sure that it's not perceived as you want to build parallel programs and segregated programs. What you want to do is include people with disabilities in the other international aid strategy. And that by that inclusion of people with disabilities, you've actually strengthened what their strategies are for their overall population. Um, I think some of the opportunities and some of the innovations that I've seen around the world, um, the organization Interaction, they are a collective of humanitarian and aid organizations, and they've identified strategies to assure that disability is included in all of their strategies. So when they have a program that is focused on housing development or employment or whatever, it's not a matter of a separate program for people with disabilities. It is if you're going to build an international aid organization or program, it will include people with disabilities from the very beginning. You will include people with disabilities in the program. You will include people with disabilities as program participants. You'll include people with disabilities as staff, as volunteers. And then there are organizations like Mobility International or USA that works with USAID to be able to help people build the skills of how to build that capacity. 
because people don't naturally come to this knowing how they're going to include people with disabilities and they don't know necessarily the strategies for reaching out to the DPOs in their countries to have them as the local experts. Um, I think one of the opportunities obviously is going to be CRPD. And by using the disability treaty, we're going to be able to emphasize that rehabilitation and assistive technology is one of the strategies for countries to be able to not only comply with the CRPD, but thrive with it. Uh, in the work that I've done, I think that the what I've seen in Peru, what I've seen in Georgia, what I've seen in Zimbabwe, what I've seen in Mali, it makes no difference whether it's north or south. What I've seen is that we have to do a better job of saying what the return on investment is. We've got to be able to identify what's in it for that organization or for that government to prioritize assistive technology and rehabilitation. We have to learn not just to tell a better story, we've got to tell our story better. We've got to be able to say, here's what the return on investment is in including people with disabilities, increasing employment of people with disabilities, here's that ripple effect that we've been talking about over the last two years. Here's where you get the strengthened assets in your community. Um, I think that if we build capacity on a collaboratory approach, a term that we heard yesterday, and we start to look at the different partnerships that are possible, um, there are people with disabilities in mainstream organizations who can and should be partners. Um, in Cuba, there's an amazing woman who is um, integral to women's rights issues in Cuba, and she's a woman with a disability. We've got to be able to identify and leverage those champions to be a part of an overall movement. Um, in the work I did in Mali, uh, one of the things that we looked at was um, a school where they really, it was a special school, um, and they were really struggling with how to be able to teach kids who are deaf sign language. And they use American Sign Language in Mali. And one of the things that we talked about was going to the Peace Corps and actively having them recruit a person who was skilled and fluent in ASL to be assigned to the country and then to be able to bring that skill set. I think we need to strategize around rehabilitation and assistive technology in those new ways of leveraging the resources that are available in low and middle income and resource countries and identifying new ways to be able to make sure that we do prioritize assistive technology and rehabilitation. Um, the whole issue about economic empowerment and making sure that it's not just competitive integrated employment, but it's also self-employment, it's entrepreneurship, it's people being able to um, identify the goods and services that they can offer in their country that will be of value. I think those are the places where we're going to see change happen. Um, and I think those are some of the innovations that I've seen happen and ones that I think are going to play out even more as the younger generation um, uses the technology that all of us see every day. They're going to take it to whole new levels that we can't even imagine right now. And I look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you so much for that incredibly powerful message. I think specifically about us being able to articulate better the return on investment that a donor gets, that a government gets when they invest in these programs. And I think for us to start seeing ourselves as part of the mainstream and working with mainstream organizations. So thank you so much for that. Um, Charlotte and Chapal, if you have anything specific you wanted to add on that. Charlotte, what do you Charlotte, over to you. Are you there? Come on, Charlotte. Are you there? Hello. 
Um, Charlotte, if you do want to speak, um, you can press the microphone again, or uh, we can stop putting you on the spot and move ahead. Just the next question. <laughs> no, I don't want to put on the spot this week. All right. Thanks, then. Um, I was just saying that I think that was, I think that was a great um, intervention. I would only add that um, I think there's an absolute need, and I think this is one of the big challenges, um, to, to build a, a, a cater of um, local DPOs, persons with disabilities, um, that work closely with government um, in terms of funding. Because when we think about it, the, the responsibility is, the obligation is on government to provide um, assistive technologies as per the, um, the disability treaty. So I think developing strong country-based um, organizations and um, institutions that can that can develop homegrown uh, assistive technologies and and um, deliver on rehabilitation is really important. I mean, I've been to um, a couple of African countries where there were three OPs in the entire country. So I think in the area of training, we really need to start thinking about that as an important piece of addressing the rehabilitation piece as well. I think there are lots of there are lots of moving parts. Um, and I think that you know pulling those together and and as as we start getting a strategy um, around how we go forward on this, it would be very important. I mean, I would even venture to say that it would be really useful to ask the the particular ministry that's responsible for um, the provision of rehabilitation and assistive devices to develop plans plans that are costed out so that we know how much they're spending um, on this issue. And I think I'll stop there. Thanks again, Charlotte. Um, well, moving on to our next question, and I think it's drawing upon what we are already hearing and this idea that uh, how do we start working with more partners and more actors and more stakeholders? And specifically, when you know, when we think about some of the other um, global development areas like global health, uh, something uh, that's been seen a lot in recent years is the the you know rapid expansion of the industry around global health technology and specifically you know low cost health technologies i mean uh, you can literally now get a handheld portable low cost ultrasound machine that is in the hands of community health workers and uh, you know people have kind of come together and they've made this possible and so when we try to borrow from that and we think about our field of rehabilitation and assistive technology, how do we involve industry and how do we involve these other players and how do we make private public collaborations possible to um, really make access to assistive technology and rehabilitation mundane and in the hands of community workers and in the hands um, of people in resource limited environments. Uh, Chapal, may I invite you to take this question? Thank you. Deepthi, thank you for giving me this opportunity. You know, the assistive technology, and we are talking so much about importance of rehabilitation and assistive technology, and as this is the way there's a zero drop discussion is going on at the UN on CRPD due to high level meeting on disability and development and to discuss about the post MDG agenda. And there is no mention of assistive technology there. So if you really want to make your case stronger, I think we have to really be more strategic to see that these issues are included in that discussion. You know, when I got this invitation to come here, 
many people ask me why you are going to America to have a discussion in the low and mid income countries. And I come again and again in this country because I know if this country really buys it, the change will be faster in the global scenario. And this is what I was doing here before coming here. I was trying to work with UNICEF and few countries, other partners, to get assistive technology at least into that zero draft discussion. At least one line there that international cooperation is needed on to increase greater access to assistive technology and transfer of technology. Thanks to our UNICEF colleagues and other few countries, now there is one line. So we can start. But I'm, I'm not stopped, and I don't believe in ending so square. So we are still struggling that we should have four or five clear messages about assistive technology in this whole discussion of disability and development of high-level meetings and further. And that's where I need everyone's support. I think assistive technology needs revolution. It's always it's the bottom most area. We have to think differently, and we have to see that what are the success models we have around us, and how we can take some of these success models to sell assistive technology. I have a small presentation. Can I see that presentation? So what we are trying to do, we are trying to develop a global, like what Lenny said in the morning, we are trying to see how we can develop a global action and global initiative on assistive technology. And as I said in my beginning yesterday, that one in five now, but these things will change very fast in coming years. And we'll need more assistive technology as we live longer and as the population increase. And assistive technology is a bridge between exclusion and inclusion. You cannot get the people out of their house if there is no assistive technology. And most of the developing world, millions of people are still inside their house, still inside their hearts, because they don't have assistive technology. So you cannot have employment, you cannot have education if you don't have assistive technology. I'll be happy if people can prove me wrong. So assistive technology is the first step for inclusion, for equal rights. And that's what UN said in 1993 in the UN standard rules. This is a prerequisition, but we have forgotten it. And this is what we are trying to see. Now convention is giving us a big opportunity. So we should now really bank on this convention and take this forward. And how we take this forward? Can you take it forward? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So WHO is uh, trying to bring all the different stakeholders, public, private, people, disabled people, especially the users group and the disabled people, academia, bring everybody together to uh, develop a global initiative, a global revolution on assistive technology. And our nickname is GATE. It's a, a global alliance for a global initiative. And how it was, you know, I am sure you have all have heard health technology and strengthening of health technology. And if you see the different components of health technology, there is a concept of essential vaccine. There is a concept of essential medicines. There is a concept of essential medical devices. But nothing about assistive technology or assistive devices. So what we need to push this health technology growth, we need a at essential assistive devices. Every country should have a list. These are the minimum assistive devices should be available in every country. And if those are not available in those countries, they should be at least exempted from customs duty. Because many times when you bring the technology from outside, the disabled people has to pay two, three times more to access it. So what we are trying to say is that we want to develop a global action, global initiative to increase access because we are talking only 5 to 15 percent people can access assistive devices and quality. It's not, I, we always say that even the poor has the right 
to have a quality product. You cannot exploit poverty. You cannot say because these are the poor people, whatever we are giving, something is better than nothing, so you have to accept it. And the cost, we have to work on the cost. The people who are in the health sector, you know, when you buy the medicine, WHO in partnership, there is a unit aid. We buy the medicine in bulk. We buy the diagnostics equipment in bulk, and the price goes down drastically. The hearing aid which you were getting in $1,000 a year, the same companies are saying, you buy in bulk, we'll give you in $100. So we have to come to this kind of a consortium kind of concept so that we can make these products affordable. And the top most is the evidence. We need more research. Without having strong, hard evidence that this assistive technology increases the education, this assistive technology increases employment, reduce poverty, we will not have any way further. So what we are trying to aim that 500 million people by 2020, 1 billion people by 2030, 1.5 billion by 2040, and 2 billion by 2050. This is our main focus. And what it will do, it will have a healthy, better health, people will be more productive, people will be independent, and they will live with dignity. What we are saying, healthy planet, healthy and productive people. But we need everybody's support. And for this reason, I have come here, so that if you are with us, then we take it further, and really we have a big initiative in coming months or years to see that majority of the people, irrespective of where they live, irrespective of their socioeconomic condition, they can have assistive devices, so they can go to the school, they can go to the college, they can go to the work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chapal. That's, that's a message that, you know, that we can leave on a, on a very high note of really um, taking this into a revolution and making a revolution happen in the field of assistive technology and opening the gate. And uh, we wish you all the very best to, you know, really make this happen and make your dream of a healthy planet and healthy and productive people come true very soon. Um, before we open it up for questions from the audience, um, I would like to, of course, ask Charlotte and Lene if they have any thoughts about how we get uh, private players involved and how do we get the industry involved. I think it, this is Lene. I think it goes back to the return on investment. Um, I think that's what will bring um, uh, public-private partnerships together. What the industry wants? They want business, right? They want number. And many industry told us that tell us how much, what is the number, what is the market. And if you can show the market, and you can, they will be interested. That's how they invested in the vaccine and medicine. Thank you. Um, Charlotte, do you uh, have I mean, I think that one of the things, uh, one of the things to to have ready if you're going to go to industry is to have um, solid research. Um, and as I said in, in my opening remarks was the importance of working with universities and think tanks and really developing the research around um, assistive technology. And I think that that really helps, you know, make the case. Um, and then I agree with the other two panelists that, you know, it really is the return on investment. But I also think that it's, um, how um, civil society and how government engages um, with the private sector. And if you, if you put um, a serious enough challenge on, onto the private sector, you usually have a few that come along with you. Um, and I mean, we've seen this, you know, we've seen this um, in various places where the private sector, you know, has gotten involved, but it needs to, it needs to grow, it needs to be something that they do um, because it makes good business sense and not because it's seen as their corporate responsibility program. Thank you so much, Charlotte. I, I think that, that again, um, really is coming across as the main message that we have to show that this, this is incredibly profitable and, you know, it's not just about corporate social responsibility. 
Um, on that, I would like to open this up to our audience, both online and in the room, uh, to questions from panelists. Uh, one request would be uh, when you ask your question, do let us know if there is a specific panelist you wanted to address that to, or just to throw it open. Thank you. My name is Alexander Anders. On? Closer? Okay. Um, I, I guess this is more a comment. I had something to do more than 25 years ago with uh, language assistive for technology. And I still cringe because, and, but I'm beginning to realize after the comments that were made that perhaps it's a really good indicator for when real inclusion is going to happen. It's like at the point in time where we no longer have to stay assistive, and we probably need it for a while longer. I think it's going to be an indicator that people with disabilities really are truly integrated because we have baby strollers, and they're just for babies, but that's mainstream. And we have car seats that are just for little kids, and we don't call them special. They're just for little kids. And only soccer players use soccer balls, but they're not special. And so I think that the day when, and it may come from Sierra Leone, when the policeman just uses those sticks to get himself around and do his job, and they're not special sticks, they're not anything special, because maybe that is going to be the indicator, when we can just go back to just plain technology for this stuff and not assistive or any of the other words that are special and kind of over there only for those people, I think we'll know the world's changed. We understand what you are saying, and there's a debate, you know, all this that uh, we ac accept the ordinarity of this whole assistive technology sector, and that's what you must have seen. In my presentation, we said disabled people, elderly people, and many non-disabled people also need assistive technology. Okay? But we do not have any term at this moment is better than what we are saying. And we are saying assistive technology, which assists in improving function. Okay? We are not talking is only for special purpose of this. So everybody uses assistive technology, especially when, as you grow older, you will. And I know some people have more than two, three. We say that after 60, every 10 years, you add one more assistive device or something. So still we have that kind of a better term. Still we have, you know, still many people do not like the word rehabilitation. Okay? But we do not have any better term than rehabilitation. Many people do not like even the disability or, or the, even if the whole thing becomes more worse when you translate in French, Spanish, or Arabic on all these different languages. But for all the languages, sometimes I feel that English language itself is a problem because they try to stereotype things, but it has to evolve. So we are waiting for that evolution. And so we are not saying that this is the word has to be fixed, but what we are trying to say, till something better comes, okay, let's stick it to it. There's no, you know, when I was small, now, or I go another 30 years, I will do different things, you know, but my name will remain the same. So many organizations try to change their name, but they have all failed, most of them. So what I'm trying to say, instead of bothering all those, we know what we are talking. So we are talking about technology which will help us to enable, to be like others. Okay? So instead of that, let's see how we can work together to ensure that policemen have a stick and other policemen also have a stick or a chair to go to, the, go to the, their job. <laughs> Questions? Just a comment. I uh, just wanted to echo what has been said by Lene and uh, uh, 
Chapal about uh, increasing the partnership uh, in government and also private uh, companies. And uh, I just wanted to add this comment that uh, whether we are talking about uh, governments or private uh, companies, we are talking about human beings. And uh, when we touch the hearts of those people, uh, there is a, a result, and that is uh, very powerful when it comes to uh, pulling them in to participate in whatever uh, needs to be done. I was reading an article from uh, one of the Kenyan newspapers, and uh, they were talking about the rich people and how now they are opening up to talk about disabilities and also talk about uh, chemical dependency because their children are now in that mix. So when it, when it has touched them, it will touch other people. So there's a cascading effect uh, from that. So. Um, another question or comment? Uh, we do have um, some comments coming from the webcast, so we'll take those uh, first. So first, there's a question. First, there's a question from this guy. Uh, his question is, I think the concept of assistive technology should also include custom-made tools, or custom-made tools, I'm sure he meant, uh, that can be adapted to a, dis to a disabled individual. The strategy can go a long way in improving skill uh, and hence make disabled individual productive in terms of becoming self-employed and source of livelihood. There, there's one more comment. So the last was from John Lee, and he says, I think uh, for the foreseeable future, we'll need assistive technology and assist stability as two sides of the same coin. Um, can't really have one without the other. You need both for optimal access, independence, and productivity. Adaptation is human nature. Nothing wrong with using assistive technology. We fully agree, and we always say that it's a two sides of the same coin, and one cannot do without others. Means you, there's no point in having accessible environment if there is no assistive devices, and there is no point of having assistive devices if the environment is not accessible. It's quite a bit like a husband and wife made for each other. <laughs> sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But still, we are coming from the south. Yeah. And so we really believe that it has to. But one thing I have also saying that don't think technology can solve all the problems. We still need human beings. Don't forget the human beings. Don't forget that human aspect, human touch. Because I have seen many countries, they have everything, but they have nobody even to talk. So that don't forget the human part. So what we need, everything to make sure the people's quality of life is good and they're productive, they're healthy, they're social, sociable, they're like us others. That's what we are trying to see. Um, uh, a few more, uh, we have time for one more. We had one there and one here. Hello? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, well, it's to, I think, to Ms. Lien, or any one of the panelists, actually. Well, when you were talking about return on investment, and then might I just humbly add that, you know, we came from Nigeria, not as a partner, so we just wanted to learn more concerning our office as a social services in Delta State. 
because what we actually, one of the things we realize is that a lot of people want to take advantage, you know, just want to make a profit. So in the, in, in the um, technology, even in, um, um, sorry ma'am, assistive technology is a word I have to use here because it's, it's used over there and a lot of people, they get into the wrong hands. You know, we're talking about even uh, wheelchairs, they get into the wrong hands and sold for a profit. You know, and we do know, and a lot of people come, try and come through our office with both of very, very both um, proposals. And um, we're, we're, we're just saying, if you want to include more, get to know through, you know, the technology, you know, the people actually, who can get it to the people that need it. So that's just my observation. We had one um, other question one or comment. That would be our last question or comment. And of course, um, as you know, our panelists are just amazing, accessible people. So I'm sure they'll take your questions later. Oh, great. <laughs> well, I just, I love the idea of a global uh, sort of initiative on getting assistive technology out there and making it a priority. And my question is a very practical one, and that is how do we get involved in your global initiative? How can we play a part in it? Um, is there going to be a website or email or, or whatever? We, we put the whole thing in the website, an idea and call for people to join and all, and then we'll have a one or two big meetings to bring different stakeholders together because if I don't bring these bits of puzzle pieces together, it will not work. So we have to have a one or two physical meetings and we have planned next year. So this now is a preparatory phase. Next year we'll have two meetings to launch this so that we are hoping that before this 2015 declaration comes, we will have something to sell there and influence post MDG or MDG to discussion. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. Charlotte, um, final yeah. comment on my end. Please go ahead, Charlotte. Um, to, I just wanted to make two points before I have to leave. Um, and, and the first one was to follow up on something that Chapal had mentioned around um, the outcomes talk, document for um, the high-level meeting on disability and development that's happening in, in, in um, September. And that is to say that, you know, this process has, I think, been a fairly um, consultative process. And so there has been the voice of uh, disabled people's organizations or the representatives of disabled people's organizations. And I think we need to make sure that um, even within um, DPOs, and within that representation, the issue of assistive technology and rehabilitation is 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 mentioned. Um, so just to flag that as an important issue. Um, the, the second point I wanted to, to to just leave you with is that, you know, I use a wheelchair myself, and I have, and and therefore I know um, quite a lot about the importance of the appropriateness of assistant te technologies. And I just want to really say that for me that's an, e an absolutely essential part of ensuring that not only do people get access to assistive technologies, but that they have appropriate assistive technologies. Because I have seen too many hundreds of children who are sitting in wheelchairs that are way too big for them. Um, often leading to, you know, further disabilities um, and complications. So I think that for me that's really an important piece. Um, and then lastly, lastly to say, you know, with the CRPD and um, the fact that that the fact that it's spurred on um, a number of bilateral donors to develop policies, I. I don't know if I mentioned, but USAID has a, a disability policy. Um, a number of other donors have policies too. So I think that forms again an excellent place to engage with donors around raising this issue. Um, I think we need to continue to push it as um, an important 
an essential aspect of inclusion and um, just make sure that we're we're at that table or somebody's at that table pushing for the importance of rehab and um, assist, assistive technologies because way too often it is an issue that gets lost in the shop. And I'll end there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Charlotte.